This video is sponsored by Brilliant, a fantastic website and app that builds your problem-solving skills and intuition. Well, I happen to think you look great always. Okay, so hear me out, but what if Nate actually is not the true villain of The Devil Wears Prada? In 2016, a BuzzFeed article called out the main character Andy's boyfriend Nate for being a textbook unsupportive partner. You got a job at a fashion magazine? Mm -hmm. oh, what was it, a phone interview? Wow. <laughs> and since then, it's been open season with countless articles and think pieces dedicated to how he holds Andy's career back and is way worse than the supposed villain of the movie, exacting fashion magazine editor Miranda Priestley. In Entertainment Weekly's oral history of the movie for its 15th anniversary, even the actor who played Nate, Adrian Grenier, agreed with this interpretation, saying, I was just as immature as him at the time, so I couldn't see his shortcomings, but after taking time to reflect and much deliberation online, I can realize the truth in that perspective. I wouldn't care if you were out there pole dancing online, as long as you did it with a little integrity. Our collective rush to see Nate as the true villain reflected the cultural moment of the late 2010s. As hashtag MeToo concerns began to dominate the zeitgeist, working woman Andy's resilience and work ethic were seen as enviable, and Miranda's cruelty was portrayed as an unfortunate necessity to a woman's professional success. Okay, she's tough, but if Miranda were a man, no one would notice anything about her except how great she is at her job. However, today's focus has shifted increasingly toward other components of the picture The Devil Wears Prada depicts, like the toxicity of runway's hustle culture, the dangers of burnout, and the problems with self-serving commercial feminism or a girl boss frame of mind. Through this lens, Nate's actions read more like concern for Andy's well-being and a desire for her to strive for a better work-life balance. Here's our take on why it's time to give Nate some credit, because he was, maybe, just a little bit right all along. I wanted to say that you were right about everything. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. Throughout the film, Andy deflects criticism of her behavior with the excuse, I didn't have a choice. To escape blame for buying into a toxic workplace culture, she makes it seem like she has no agency over what her job compels her to do. Nate calls her out for this. Your answer for everything lately. I didn't oh, have a choice. Nate, like this job was forced Nate, on you. Like I you don't make it. these decisions okay. yourself. In reality, not only does Andy have a choice, but she makes choices that negatively impact her relationships, her life outside of work, and her conception of herself as a person with integrity. One of the things Nate gets criticized for most is his reaction to Andy missing his birthday party for a last minute work benefit. There was a lot going on and you know, I didn't have a choice. I go to bed. But here Andy does choose to put her toxic job above him and doesn't really think about his feelings much in the process. It's true that she doesn't plan this and only goes to the benefit when it's clear that Emily is too sick to go by herself, but she doesn't make a genuine effort to set a boundary with Miranda and prioritize her personal plans. In fact, she soon becomes excited to be there. And rather than leaving at the earliest opportunity, Andy embraces the event as her coming out ball, the moment she's finally arrived in the fashion world that she previously wanted no part of. Andy, you look so chic. Oh, thanks, Ev. This is also where the roots of her flirtatious relationship with Christian begin to grow, and when he insults Nate right in front of her, she doesn't say anything to spurn his advances. Wow. If it weren't for the stupid boyfriend, I'd have to whisk you away right here and now. Do you actually say things like that to people? <laughs> Given all that, is Nate's reaction really that unreasonable or unrelatable? On a broader level, the condemnation of Nate is focused around the idea he's unsupportive of Andy's career, an argument that is backed up by signs of admittedly misogynistic views about the fashion industry. <laughs> Why do women need so many bags? Shut up! You have one, you put all your junk in it, and that's it, you're done. However, his discouraging attitude toward her job is rooted in the fact that Andy's runway gig is not directly relevant to the journalism career she actually desires. At first, Nate is practical about the fact she has to take a position tangentially related to her dream job, as are all of Andy's friends. The jobs that pay the rent. The jobs yes. that pay the rent. But he soon recognizes that it's taking her away from her core values and ideal work path, well before Andy realizes this for herself. You used to say this was just a job. You used to make fun of the runway girls. 
What happened? Now, now you've become one of them. Nate also never puts his own occupation above his relationship with Andy, despite working as a trainee chef, a position notorious for long hours and hectic schedules. True, he should have more patience with her while she's going through a transitional phase, but he's right when he says that Andy is prioritizing a job she claims not to really care about at the expense of everything else. You know, in case you were wondering, the person whose calls you always take, that's the relationship you're in. I hope you two are very happy together. Ironically, it's Miranda who ultimately vindicates Nate's feelings when she asserts that Andy's I didn't have a choice complaints are nothing but excuses. I didn't have a choice. Oh no, you chose. You chose to get ahead. Hearing the words from her dark mentor's mouth is the wake-up call Andy needs to grasp what path she's going down and to consider whether it's truly what she wants. It's important here that Andy makes her own decision without Nate to leave Runway behind and stop herself from becoming the next ruthless Miranda who gets ahead by any means necessary and steps on a series of competitors along the way. I turn my back on my friends and my family and on everything I believed in and, and for what? But it's hard to blame him for foreseeing the lonely future she was designing for herself and calling it from the start. Although The Devil Wears Prada's Andy was wrong about a lot, she did teach us one thing. The best way to learn is through doing and being challenged. So if you want to do that in your own life and find the success she ultimately does, you should check out this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an incredible website that encourages active learning and problem solving. When you sign up for Brilliant, you get access to exciting interactive courses that are designed to improve brain performance. Plus, they've recently upped the interactivity on their platform to a new level. I recently tried the Scientific Thinking course, where I explored the laws of physics and principles of engineering through fun scientific puzzles. Thanks to the course, I look at the world a little differently. Just like how I look at Nate differently after this video. Want to join me? Click the link in the description down below or visit brilliant.org slash the take. environment of runway exemplifies a what doesn't kill you makes you stronger attitude. Miranda has inspired a culture of fear among her staff. She's on her way. Tell everyone. All right, everyone, gird your loins. And they eventually learn to inflict awful treatment on themselves and others in order to stand out and progress within the industry. Even when Andy eventually leaves that environment, the final moments of the film imply that she's benefited greatly from this cutthroat learning experience. After all, it's Miranda's education and her reference that gets Andy a new job in journalism. I got a fax from Miranda Priestley herself. If I don't hire you, I am an idiot. But all along, Nate rails against this mindset that a boss is entitled to completely take over their employees' personal lives. And today's culture is increasingly backing up Nate's point of view, with movies like The Assistant shining a spotlight on how not okay much of the behavior we've long tolerated from powerful bosses truly is. I'm not gonna yell at you. I'm not yelling now. Because you're not someone even worthy of that. In reality, the what doesn't kill you part of the aphorism also doesn't hold weight, with a study from the World Health Organization finding that overwork, defined as working more than 54 hours per week, actually kills three quarters of a million people each year. Pick up the Polaroids from the lingerie shirt. Have the brakes checked on my car. <laughs> And in addition to the psychological effects of unmanageable stress, Christine Rowe explains that overwork can lead to long-term physiological damage, writing those logging long hours may be sleeping little, barely exercising, eating unhealthy foods, and smoking and drinking to cope. We see this most visibly through Emily, who starves herself for her job. Well, I'm on this new diet. It's very effective. Well, I don't eat anything. And when I feel like I'm about to faint, I eat a cube of cheese and gets hit by a car because she's so distracted by her unreasonable to-do list. But Andy soon adopts this abusive work ethic as well, proving that it's a cultural problem rather than an individual one. Runway rules its employees with fear of what will happen if they can't keep up. 
One time an assistant left the desk because you know, she sliced her hand open with a letter opener and Miranda missed Lagerfeld. She now works at TV Guide. To Nate's credit, at first he's very caring toward Andy, pouring her wine and making her late night snacks, but he wants her to see that she doesn't have to put up with a toxic workplace in order to forge a career in journalism. When she first considers quitting her job, his reaction isn't to gloat, make fun, or say I told you so, but instead to celebrate with her. Andy. Good for you, congratulations, you're free. He recognizes that Andy, maybe for the first time in the movie, has made a choice that puts her health and well-being above any vague career-related promises. I went to Dean and DeLuca. Man, they charge like $5 a strawberry there. But I figure, since you quit your job, we should celebrate. Ultimately, today there's been a backlash against the kind of hustle culture that Runway Magazine typifies, not just from a mental health perspective, but from a capitalist perspective, too. Research from Oxford University in 2019 found that workers are 13% more productive when they're happy. And happy isn't exactly the first word you would use to describe the Runway staff. The narrative arc of The Devil Wears Prada hinges on Andy's transformation from ignorant fashion novice Both of those belts look exactly the same to me. to fabulous, resourceful fashionista. For the audience, this signals how Andy is overcoming adversity and beginning to thrive in her new environment, but for Nate, it signals she's becoming a completely different person from the one he was in a relationship with. Just own up to it, and then we can stop pretending like we have anything in common anymore. One way this manifests is through food, which is very personal to Nate given his line of work. The first act of love we see him perform for Andy is making her a late night grilled cheese sandwich. However, it only takes one day of work for Andy to reject his offer to feed her. I'm not even hungry anymore. Her changing eating habits is the first step in Andy becoming a runway girl, which is unsurprising given the negative attitude toward food at the magazine. Before she is even officially hired, Nigel makes a loaded comment about smelling Andy's breakfast. Someone eat an onion bagel? And at lunch, Nigel again criticizes Andy for, well, eating lunch. You do know that cellulite is one of the main ingredients in corn chowder. But Andy soon buys into this culture, seeing weight loss as a way to measure her success in the fashion publishing world. You bet your size six ass. <laughs> Four. Andy's psychological transformation coincides with her physical transformation, something that Nate also sees as evidence that she is becoming a different person. Same Andy. Better clothes. <laughs> I like the old clothes. Interestingly, the film's screenwriter, Aline Brush McKenna, said that Nate's role is, in most film and TV, a girlfriend part. That's a part that a lot of women end up playing, that why aren't you home more, the naggy wife. I have to say that character was the biggest challenge to write, and oddly, the character director David Frankel and I talked about the most, because we wanted to make sure he wasn't a pain in the ass, but he is the person who's trying to say, is this who you want to be, morally? Of course, Nate's reaction to Andy's physical and mental shift isn't the most mature. Instead of talking about his feelings with Andy, he whines, pouts, and plays the victim. Or your job sucks and your boss is a wacko. And he also doesn't express that the conditions she's working under are bad for her as an individual. Instead, he just voices his complaints as they relate to their relationship. But his immature reactions don't completely devalue the things he's right about, and most of us can relate to not acting like our best selves when we feel hurt by or concerned about people we love. Ultimately, Nate and Andy both want the same things, to have successful careers and a successful relationship. Andy's biggest failing is not knowing how to strike that balance, while Nate struggles with having the emotional maturity to troubleshoot their relationship. One of the most striking things about The Devil Wears Prada is just how many potential villains there are. There's Christian, the skeevy journalist who tries to seduce Andy through a mixture of professional clout and old-fashioned negging. Never survived Miranda. Andy's friends, who are just as unsupportive as Nate's accused of being. This glamazon who skulks around in corners with some random hot fashion guy? I don't get her. Emily, who's pathologically competitive and only comes around to Andy when her coworker gifts her clothes from Paris. Jacqueline Follet, the editor of French Runway, whose eyes are firmly focused on Miranda Priestley's job. And Miranda herself, who for all her admirable success as a businesswoman today represents some of the flaws of girl boss feminism, treating her staff terribly and throwing Nigel, arguably the most likable character in the film, under a bus. When the time is right, she'll pay me back. 
You sure about that? In the end, The Devil Wears Prada is too nuanced to label any one person its only villain, and is more interested in showing how all these people are driven to behave badly because they're part of a noxious work culture. Andy's victory is extracting herself from this culture and mindset, finding success without having to sacrifice herself. She represents a new way, where it's possible to be great at one's job without being a terrible person or living your whole life at your desk. Today, we've arguably come full circle in our cultural shifts towards being able to appreciate this message of the movie as it's intended and to hear Nate as a kind of voice of reason and morality in Andy's head as she starts heading down a path that, deep down, she ultimately knows isn't the right destination for her. By the end of the film, it's clear that both Nate and Andy's immaturity led to the fracturing of their relationship, though they eventually reconcile. The audience can't know for sure whether the two end up together after the credits roll, when Nate is a sous chef in Boston and Andy is a journalist in New York. Regardless, it's clear that Andy doesn't blame Nate for his behavior, Nate is glad Andy is back to being the person he fell in love with, and Andy understands that in the end, Nate just wanted what was best for her. We might be able to figure something out. You think? Yeah. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take.